We want to say greetings to everyone. We thank you all for joining us today and those that have joined us online. Also, those that are listening in or watching us live also. And uh, those who will watch this broadcast on TV or listen to it on the radio, we thank God for you all uh, joining us today. And we pray that something will be said that will help you in your your walk with the Lord. That is uh, our aim. That is what we want to do is we want to help you to grow closer to the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> it's not that we think that we're any closer than anybody else. It's just uh, this is what we've been called to do is to help people, you know, in our in our journey uh, and, and on our walk with the Lord. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's go to the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew. And uh, we just thank God just for the word and, you know, for helping us. I tell you, I don't know if anybody, I'm sure other people have this this moment, you know, where you you're reading God's word and and you see yourself in it and you think, oh, thank you, Lord, for placing that there. You know, that's something that's going to really help me. And uh, we should always have those moments where we're reading God's word and we see somewhere, see an area in our lives where we're coming up short and we want uh, we want to come up higher in those areas. And I'm going to tell you, uh, until we learn to identify those things, like my wife was saying, until we learn to identify those areas and <clears throat> and give those areas to God and grow in those areas, <clears throat> we won't grow in any other areas, you see. We just we the law won't reveal anything else to us. We have to we have to do what we know to do first. You know, and if we don't get to that where we know we, we're doing what we know what to do, then God won't come and give us anything else. You know, and so right there is where we stop growing right there. where we refuse to where we the area that we refuse to submit to God. That's exactly where we stop growing at, you know. I remember years ago when I first started preaching, I was praying and I asked the Lord, Lord, I'll be glad when you give me some things to do in your kingdom. You know, give me give me more things to do, I should say. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you haven't done everything that I've told you to do yet. In other words, don't don't ask for any anything else, any other assignments until you've committed yourself to doing what I've already told you. And a lot of times we just we just stay put where we are because. Uh, we refuse to grow in certain areas, but I'm, I'm telling you, the time is getting short, and uh, we have to quit putting off, you know, these things that God is telling us to do or telling us not to do, whatever the case may be. Uh, we have to get serious with this word and, and not just think that it's something to do. You know, if God loves us enough to correct us with his word, we better love him enough to receive that correction and grow by that correction, you see. A, a child that you tell not to do something and they just continue to do it and they just continue to to get chastised for it, then that child will never grow. You know, they may grow naturally. So uh, but they'll just be their mind will be stuck wherever it is that they decided to rebel at. And uh, that's that's what happens to us. You know, if God loves us, he'll chasten us. And many times we get chastened not knowing why we're being chastened or just too stubborn to really realize, hey, Maybe it's me. I'm in this situation that I'm in because of me, you see. And so we, we let's ask the Lord, you know, let's let's be sincere and just bring those things to God. God want us to be honest in our walk with him. You see, he want us to be honest. Now, if you can't be honest with God, then you're just you're just wasting your time coming to church. You're wasting your time even playing a Christian, you know, just you have to be honest with him. Now, if you got some issues that you need to work on. Uh, the last thing you want to do with God is make excuses for those issues. You see, mm -hmm. you just have to be honest. And, you know, I mean, even in sin. And let me make this clear, you know, and the Lord made this clear to me. When you love doing something, if you got any inch in you and you love doing something, whether it, whatever it may be, you know, the pleasures of this life. If, if there's any part of you that like doing it, God will not take it from you. When when if you like backbiting or if you like lying or, you know, of course, now those are pleasures of this world, you know, fornication, things like that. If it's any part of you that like doing it, then the devil that's that's in you doing it. He got a right to be there. You see, he has a right to be there. 
And so many of us, we go to the Lord, Lord, take this from me. And God will say, well, you know, no, I'm not going to. You like it too much. Amen. I'm not going to take it from you, only for you to come turn around tomorrow and get it back from me. So you just you just stay put until you get miserable and get tired of doing that same thing over and over again until you until you hate it. That's, right. That's what the fear of the Lord is. To hate it. Now, if you don't get to that point where you hate it, then it's yours. It's yours to keep. You see. Now, I'm going to just say don't die that way. You see, <laughs> don't just don't die that way. You see. And so we have to get to that point where we hate sin. We hate the things in our lives, the stronghold that the enemy may have over us. We have to get to that place where we hate those things. And then that's when God can move in and say, okay, mm -hmm. since you hate it, the devil doesn't have a right to be there with it. And so I'll, I'll get it from you, you see. But that's when deliverance comes is when we is when we uh, when we actually hate those things. And many of people, they play with God or call themselves playing with God. God, I don't know why I'm this way or I don't know. You know, we have to be honest with him. We have to say, Lord, it's some things in me that I don't like, but I, I find pleasure in them some kind of way. Mm -hmm. So will you change my heart towards it? Right. Make me see it the way that you see it. Amen. The Bible says that that sin stinks in the nostrils of God. If we saw things the way that God see it, we would run from it. Sometimes I have to share things with my wife about, you know, different things that the Lord have shown me. And, and you know, and the way that the Lord showed me, you know, it, it, it would just blow your mind sometimes. Uh, if I see, you know, there are people that I, that I have dealt with who I would see uh, that had a real bad spirit on them, a, a spirit of uh, fornication. And, and if I see them. With with that spirit on them, I'll see who they're dealing with. And the way that I see them is if it's a female, they'll have male body parts, the male genitalia. And if it's a male, they'll have a female because, see, that's what's going on in the spiritual realm. You're taking a hold of something that don't belong to you. And so it's perverted. Now, in your mind, hey, I'm just having a good time. We'll sleep together and we'll repent tomorrow. But the way God sees it, you're taking something that belongs to you. It's not natural for a man to have female parts. just like it's not natural for a woman to have male parts. But in the spiritual realm, when you get all of that twisted up, that's what you got. And so now you have to be delivered, you see. And you may say, well, that's, that's just kind of wild. But see, that's what's going on in the spiritual realm. That's what I mean. If you saw it the way God see it, you wouldn't you wouldn't run to it. You'd get away from it. <laughs> You'd get away from it. Amen. I can go on and on about some of those types of things, but you know, we just say that God want us to grow. He want us to to grow in Him. Amen. All right, we're at the fifth chapter of Matthew. We've been talking about um, kingdom principles, and the night I believe the Lord is going to have us to go through a few things. Uh, we skipped a few verses down. We're going to talk about adultery uh, in, a, in, in another instant, you know, and, and divorce and things like that with this in the earlier part of this chapter. We'll go over that at another time. But tonight we're going to start reading at verse 33 at the fifth chapter of uh, Matthew. Uh, it says, and again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time. Thou shalt not forswear thyself. But shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Now, every time we, we read this in this chapter, what Jesus is saying is this is the way that it's normally have been done. This is what you've been taught. You heard it been said this way. But I'm telling you, in other words, in the kingdom of darkness, it may operate this way. Or in the old covenant, it may operate this way. You see, but I'm telling you the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is the way the kingdom of heaven operates. And so that word for swear, it, it means to perjure yourself. It means to say you're going to do something and then not do it. He says, so in times of old, you heard it been said, don't do that. You see now what Jesus is doing throughout this whole chapter, the fifth chapter of Matthew is getting people to think deeper than what they've been thinking to get them to get to the root of the problem. 
In other words, before he came along, people were just dealing with the surface stuff. In other words, the surface being this. Well, Lord, when I sin, I'm going to come and I'm going to repent to you. And, and then I'm going to sin and then I'm going to come again and I'm going to repent again. That's the, that's the surface stuff. The surface stuff is, Lord, um, I, I don't like, you know, being in, in this relationship or, you know, I, I can't get past this idea of, of what's taking place. I have trust issues and, and things like that. I, I just it's just some things about it that I don't like. That's on the surface. But what God does is he deals with the effects of it and, and uh, the cause of it. In other words, in other words, why is it that way? When John the Baptist came preaching, his message was the axe is laid to the root of the tree. What was he talking about? That, you know, you can you can go outside and uh, you may find a fruit tree and <clears throat> you, you, you can pick fruit off of that tree all day. You can say, you know what, I'm going to kill this tree and the way I'm going to kill it, I'm going to pull all the fruit off of it. Next year, you have some more fruit there. And people spend their whole life doing that. I'm going to kill this tree by pulling the fruit off of it. I don't like backbiting with my tongue, so I just keep my mouth shut. That'll handle that. I just think happy thoughts. That'll handle it. And God says, well, no, that comes from your heart. And you may say, well, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to fornicate anymore. And so I'll just stay away from men. I'll just keep myself chaste and I'll just stay away from men. Or I'll stay away from women or people that I'm attracted to. I'll just watch it that way. And God says, it starts in your heart. You have to get to the root of it. Everybody see. And so even though you may not be doing it physically, the problem's still there. And so then you spend the rest of your life on edge. Hoping that you don't fall into certain things, hoping that you don't do that. And then when you do it, you're, you're heartbroken, you're repenting again, and now I'm back to square one. Now, when the devil get finished taking you around that mountain for 30 years of your life, you ready to throw your hands up and say, God, I can't live this Christian life. And God said, well, you go to my word and read it where it tells you I take that stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. In other words, I have to give you a heart transplant. Your heart hasn't changed yet. And so your, your, the way that you see sin hasn't changed yet. So it becomes easier for you to fall into it because you don't hate it yet. Mm -hmm. You still have your old nature. You're trying to live a new life still hanging on to your old nature. And, and so that's where you get yourself in trouble at. All right. So here he says, uh, verse 34, it says, but I say unto you. Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shall thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Now, what is he saying? You know, when you say that you're going to do something, just say that. Now, when we get, you know, when, when I was little and growing up, you know, of course, kids, we just kind of silly. You know, we'd say things like, man, I promise you, I swear on my daddy's grave. <laughs> well, I just didn't start, you know, when we were young. That was going on back then. People were swearing on this. I put that on my mama. <laughs> and the Lord is saying, don't do that. If you, you know, when you, when you got to jump through hoops to convince people that you're going to do what you say you're going to do, that means that something isn't right there. That means your word isn't good enough. I'm going to write you an IOU. You know, I, I mean, we do we've done all kinds of things to prove. No, just you, you, your action is going to speak louder than your words. Just do it. That's all. Just do it. You know, don't. And so the law is saying anything other than this is evil. 
Now, I'm going to tell you, you know, now, of course, to the person that you are saying that you're going to do it to, you know, that you're going to do this thing for or whatever the case may be, they may see it as evil. But I'm going to tell you the way God sees it, that he says that there's not one hair on our head that we can make black or gray. What does he mean? That when you are promising something, I'm going to do this and I, I promise you that I'm going to do it. What you're doing is you're totally removing God out of the equation. In other words, what does God have to do with it? I'm going to be living tomorrow. So I'm going to do this. I promise you. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says that all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. And so when you say that you're going to do something and, and you're swearing and, and you're making all of these promises, you see, uh, and, and you and you leave here without performing those things. <clears throat> then you leave here a liar. You see, now we may say, well, that's that's kind of hard to deal with, you know, I especially if you really mean I'm going to tell you something. How many of us have ever said, Lord, I I'm going to do this and really mean it. God, I'm going to quit. Mm -hmm. This is the last time I'm going to do this. And you crying and, and, and it, you really mean what you say. Mm -hmm. Now, the only problem is you got a devil there. That's, that's willing to bet against you. That's what the Bible means when it says that you, you stand, take heed that you stand, lest you fall. In, in other words, you got a devil there that's wanting to make you a liar. And, 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 and the last thing you want to do is make promises to God of what you're going to do and, and you know, how you're not going to do this anymore and, and all of that. What it does, he, he, see, the, the law says that anything other than yes and no is evil. Why? Because it comes from pride. Mm -hmm. You see, you you saying what you're going to do. If you go to the to the I think it's the book of Isaiah, when the Bible spells out what happened with the devil, he kept saying, I'm going to exalt my throne above the stars of God. He just kept saying what all he was going to do. And God made him a liar. No, you're not going to do that. You see? And so what it is, is it's pride. It, it stems from pride. Whenever we say what we're going to do, I promise you what you're telling God is I have control over my life. You tell somebody, I promise you, I'll, I'll pick you up tomorrow for, for work. Or I promise you, I promise that I'm going to do this. What you're telling God is it doesn't matter what your plan is. Everybody see that? Now, let me t make this clear. God is love, but he also knows who he is. Now, if we understood that, we, we move, you know, we move a little bit better around him. And what I mean is as soon as we get to the point where we understand that we don't control time, that we don't control anything, and that we're at his mercy all the time. Every breath that we take is his air. You see? And that's why, you know, uh, I've been quick to tell people, I I'm pretty sure that if I decided to stop preaching, I wouldn't live another six months or so. Because it's his hair I'm breathing. As soon as I decide, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. I I you know, why should he let me keep living? I'm just sucking up his air. Just let somebody else breathe that's going to breathe it, that's going to do what he say do. Now, until you get to that point, you know, then you'll just be living a, a life of van vanity. You see, you have to get to that point where, you know, every breath that you take, it belongs to him. And there are and, and there are a lot of people in the graveyard that will tell you that. That, you know, tomorrow is not promised. And so when we when we're talking about spending our time, you see, because this is this is where we're going. We, we can't make promises of what we're going to do. We it's a danger. And, and we are we are treading in places that angels don't tread in when we start making plans for our lives and, and not consult God about it. The angels don't even do that. Now, there were some ones that tried it, but they're not they're not they didn't keep their first estate. The Bible says, you see. And so when we make plans, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You know, you're just Xing God out. 
Now, I'm going to tell you something, you know, uh, uh, my wife and I, our children will, let, will tell you, uh, you know, the ones that are, are still young, they don't come to us telling us what their plans are. Don't come, come here saying, I I'm going down the street to play, or I'm going I'm to do this. Uh, you're going to get corrected real quick. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not God. We're not God. But see, I, I don't control the air that they breathe. And I don't have the right to take their life, but we serve one that does. You see, I don't and I don't even have a plan for their life. You see, I don't I, I, when our children are born, I don't say, well, you're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a preacher. I, I don't plan. I, that's, that's God's deal for them. And so if we reverence our own parents in that, how much more so should we reverence God? That one who gave us life to begin with so that his plan could be worked through our lives. You see that? So we, we, just have to, we just have to look at it that way. We just have to look at it that way. Now let's go real quick to the, to the book of James. Uh, the fourth chapter of the book of James. And see, if we're going to operate in, in God's kingdom, now I'm going to tell you, in the kingdom of darkness is every man for himself. You can just do whatever you want to do. You can make all kinds of plans for your life. It doesn't matter. The devil don't care as long as you're not living for God. That's all he's concerned about. You can be whatever you want to be. He'll let you have whatever career you want to have. He'll let you live wherever you want to live. It's, it, that, that kingdom is based on selfishness and self. And so... The only thing he's concerned about is making sure you're not serving God. And so he will give you the desires of your heart as long as those desires are way away from God. You see that many people today that are living in this earth, that, that are living in this world, that are, are, are living for him. He's giving them what they have because he wants to keep them where they are. You see that? And so he doesn't, in that kingdom of darkness, it's, it doesn't he doesn't matter. He doesn't come to you and say, well, you know, um, this is my plan for you. The devil's only plan for you is for you to go to hell with him. Now, how you get there in between birth and death is up to you. In the kingdom of darkness. All he want is for you not to serve God, for you to be on his side. That's it. That's the only qualification you got to have to belong to the kingdom of darkness. Just don't serve God. You see. And, and he, he'll, he'll make sure that your life is comfortable for you. And, and he, he, you know, and if you've got enough sense in that world to, to make a deal with him, if, I mean, you might as well, if you're going to hell, go ahead and make a deal so you can live comfortable on this side. And if you've got enough sense to do that, he'll grant you whatever you want. That's what he came to Jesus with. You know, I, I, I'll give you all of this if you bow down and worship me. I give you all of the kingdoms of this world. And you know what? He's still doing that same thing today. I, I give you this as long as you don't serve God. As long as you just just remain as filthy as you want to be. I give you this. I give you everything that you desire in this world as long as you don't serve God. And so over there in the kingdom of darkness, there is no 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 rules or, or regulations. It's just every man for himself. You don't have to. Worry about the plan that the devil have for you. His only plan is that you go to hell with him. How you get there, that's up to you. Now, in the kingdom of, of, of righteousness, in that kingdom of light, it, is, it operates completely different. God has a straight and a narrow. That's what the Bible means in the seventh chapter of Matthew. Wide is the way. In other words, the devil got a whole wide road for you to walk down. You can walk on this side of the street or on that side. Don't matter to him as long as you're on that, that broad way. You see that? But God's way is completely different. It's narrow. It's a straight line. There are no jagged edges in it. There's no, no, no zigzagging. It's straight. And you have to walk that perfect line. Everybody see that? Uh, one, one, uh, 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 several years ago, I had a, a vision and I was walking down this, this dark road, the, that valley of the shadow of death. And on each side were dogs. On each side of that road were, were dogs, and uh, they were demonic dogs. And they, all of them had a leash on them. And, you know, I mean, just, just 
just a few steps. You just take a few steps and it's two more dogs. Just And they all had a leash on them and they were able to come out so far into that road. And so what I knew, I had to walk that center line, that straight line, because if I got off of it in, in any direction, the ones on this side could get me or the ones on that side could get me. And so I had to walk that straight and narrow line to keep from, from becoming a victim of those, those demons. And, and that's the way it is, you see. We have to walk the straight and narrow uh, in the kingdom of God. And we have to, and that straight and narrow means you have to be in God's will for your life. Now, let me make this clear. You, you may say, well, I, I'm serving God. I'm a Christian. Let me make this clear. It, it's, it's more to it than that. And you can't say, well, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I think it would be a good idea if I just preach or if I sing or if I do praise and worship, if I do that. It, it takes more than that. What do you mean? What is God's will for you? That's your straight and narrow. Everybody see that? It's not meant for everybody to be preachers, and so we can't just all volunteer to go into that. So e even if you call yourself serving God, if you get into an office that God didn't call you to, you're still off track. Well, you say, well, where's that in the Bible? You just go to the book of Numbers and, and, and read about Korah and his company. They were praise and worship people, but that wasn't good enough. They were in the tribe of Levi. Levi was not good enough. They wanted to be priests. God, I want to serve you in a bigger capacity is what they thought. Well, really, it was just pride that was there. And so they made themselves priests and God didn't recognize their, their burnt offerings or anything like that. In fact, uh, God split the earth open and they went into hell alive. Why? Because they got out of God's will. God's will was for them to remain what, what they were, what he created them to be. Amen. So even though they were saying, we want to do something bigger for you, God, God was saying, no, your bigger for me is to stay in the place where I've put you, you see. And so it's not enough just to be in church. You be what God wants you to be in church, you see. And quit thinking that one of them, one thing is better than the other one. You see, that, that, that's not the way God see it. All right, so <clears throat> the fourth chapter of the book of James. And we'll start reading at verse 13. It says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be done on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. You see that? He says, you pay attention to what I'm about to tell you. Uh, don't, don't you even let that come out of your mouth about what you're going to be doing next year. Your life is a vapor. God's been living since living has begun. There is no time with him, but it is with you in this natural realm. And so he's saying, don't do that because that's, you know, whether you want to realize it or not, you're shaking your fist at God when you're telling God what you're going to be doing next year. When you write not what your five year plan is, you better get God's five year plan for your life and stand on that. Everybody see? Because anything else is pride. Anything other than that is pride. When we're telling God how we're going to spend our time, this year I'm going to do this, next year I'm going to do that, and the following year I'm going to be in this place, it better be in God's will because that's the only thing that he accepts. That, that's the only thing that he accepts, you see. It says, uh, verse 15, now, of course, God gives us an out. There's a way because you, you, may, you may be wondering, well, what are we supposed to do? We're just not supposed to do anything, not supposed to say anything about what we're going to do or what our intentions are or whatever the case may be. God shows us how we ought to talk. You see, verse 15, for ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. In other words, if it's God's will, because if it's not, you're not going to do this or that. And what that does, it, you're showing God that you're recognizing him. That what place that he has in your life concerning what he wants you to do. Amen. You see. You see, verse 16, but now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. You see that? Therefore, to him that knoweth 
that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. In other words, now that you've heard this message, it's sin when, when, you, when you're saying what you're going to do tomorrow. Again, again, see, our minds have to be renewed in this new kingdom, in the kingdom of righteousness. Before we got saved, we, didn't, we could care less about what God's plan was. We really thought we're going to live for a long time. Mom and daddy lived to be 80, so we, at least we'll live to be that way, you see. And we'll think that we have our whole life planned ahead of us, except we don't. I'm going to tell you something. Time is, is, is something with God, you know. Our lives are precious to him, and he, he intends for us to do what he wants us to do with that time. Now, if we miss that, then we'll completely miss him. As I've stated before, uh, uh, ever since I, I've known myself, knew that I existed in this world, I knew that I was called to preach. And, uh, you know, in fact, that was the, the first nickname that I had. That's what they called me, the little preacher, you see. And when I was one, two, and three years old, Mama would dress me up in a suit. And I had a little Bible with me, and I had even my little hat, you see. And so I, I looked like a little preacher, and so that's the name that the people at the church gave me, the little preacher. And uh, I didn't remember that until I got older. And there was a lady that came to the church, and, uh, and my mother was talking to her, and she looked at me, this lady, and she said, Is this the little preacher? She said, Yeah, that's him. You know, <laughs> of course, I was grown at that time. But, you know, uh, so ever since I can remember, I knew that I was called to preach. Even before I began to talk, uh, my mother said I would take that spoon and I would just walk up and down the hall preaching. Just walk up and down the hall just preaching like that. And so um, I had an auntie who was always telling me when I was a little, you know, you, you better do what God called you to do. And, you know, of course, I, I'm little now. I'm six, seven, eight years old. Uh, on up until about 12, she would tell me that. You better do what God have called you to do. And, you know, in my mind, you know, I'm just a kid. I want to have, let me have fun first. Every time I see you, I don't want to be scared into serving the Lord and preaching. So let me have fun. And so I remember being about 12 years old, sitting across the table from her. And uh, again, you know, we were eating Thanksgiving dinner, you see. And before we could start eating good, she said, you, you better do what God called you to do. And I, I just began thinking, well, you know, I, I'll be glad when I can visit with you and, and you just not bring this up. I, I can't even eat Thanksgiving dinner without you telling me this. You see, that was my mindset. I just I just, you know. And so living in rebellion, you know, I thought, yeah, yeah, sure will. I, I'll do what the Lord tell me to do when I get old and can't do anything else. That now that was what I thought. And she picked it up and she said, and don't think that you're going to wait until you get old and can't do anything else. She said, because the Lord will fix it to where you, when you get older, he'll take your mind from you where you can't even make decisions. To serve him anymore. Okay, you got me this time. <laughs> so, you know, fast forward to 20 years old. I'm preaching. I come back. I get out of the military. I come back home. And uh, she's sitting there at my mother's house. And I pull off to the side. And I say, Bert, I said, you were always telling me that. I said, why were you always telling me that? And she said, well, she said, when you were a little boy... She said, I was sitting in my living room, and a man walked through my wall, and uh, he, he told me, if your nephew don't start doing what God have called him to do, uh, God's going to take his hand off of him. In other words, he's not going to be protected, you see. And so, you know, I, I can go on from story after story about how God have saved my life. I knew what she meant when she told me that, because God has saved my life several times. I, when I was... Uh, uh, 11 years old, I went to a coma for no apparent reason, you know, and, and, and just just different things. I can remember having surgery when I was little and still don't know what the surgery was about. You see, I've been on two planes that have almost crashed. I, I got on another plane that, you know, I prayed and, and asked the Lord because I knew it's just something in me that knew that something was wrong. And I prayed and asked the Lord, which was my only time ever praying that prayer. If there's something wrong with this plane, don't let it get off the ground. And so we're there on the runway about to take off, you know, behind we're waiting behind his other plane because they're they're, they're going to take off. And so before I know it, instead of us, you know, speeding up like what planes do, this plane just pulled off to the side 
And then I look out the window, there come some technicians coming in. And before I knew it, they were escorting us off the plane, telling us that that plane wasn't fit to fly. And so I knew, you know, I knew I was on a plane in Africa, uh, flying from New Cairo, West Egypt, to Mogadishu, Somalia. Uh, well, I'm sorry, in, in reverse. It was flying from Mogadishu, Somalia, back to New Cairo, West Egypt. This plane caught on fire in the air. So, you, you see, I, I knew when, when I talked to her and she said that, I knew exactly what she was talking about. The Lord's going to take his hand off of you. In other words, the only reason why you're still living is because God's got something for you to do. In other words, my life is his time. Everybody see that? Everything that I do, I have to dedicate it to him. It has to be for him, you see. And that's what this means. Verse 16, but now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Now, what is that? Why does he say it that way? All you're saying is where you're going to go tomorrow or what you're going to do next year. You're not clapping and singing while you're saying it. So why is he saying rejoicing? Because in the spirit realm, when you're shaking your, when you're telling God what you're going to do, or when you're telling anybody what you're going to do, and God hears it, in God's mind, you're rejoicing. It, that's pride, and you're boasting in it. Whenever you do anything without recognizing God, you've just made a God out of yourself. You see? And you say, well, I, I don't know about that. Well, let's go look at that. Let's go to the 12th chapter of the book of Luke real quick. First chapter of the book of Luke, and uh, we'll, we'll start reading at verse 16. It says, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now this is for folks with their retirement plans. Now I want you to notice something. He, he didn't say this out loud. The Bible says he said this within himself. Now, let me make this clear. God hear your thoughts just as well as he hear your words coming out of your mouth. All right. Verse 20. But God said unto him, thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So he, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself is not and, and is not rich toward God. Now, many times. When we hear uh, this little this this uh, story here that the Lord have talked about, a lot of times we equate that with natural things. But we have to take a close look at this. You know, this man said, I, I, I got all of this riches. I, I got enough to live on for years and years. And so I'm going to retire now. Now, if you look at God's response to him, God didn't have a problem with him having things. Everybody see that? The problem wasn't the fact that God is the one that blessed him with that stuff, that, gave, that allowed that fruit to come forth. And so God didn't have a problem with him having the things. Let's see. Let's go look at what the, 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 the problem is. Verse 19, and I will say to my soul, so thou hast much goods laid up for how, for what? Many years. In other words, it doesn't matter what, what God got to say about the rest of my years. I'm good to go for, the, for a long time. In other words, I'm not even thinking about what God's plan is. In other words, you know, for us today, let's not say that we're going to retire or that we're going to do this and do that. 
This man's sin was not the fact that he had all of these goods, but the fact that I, I'm, I'm, I'm done for the rest of my life. All I'm going to do is just eat and get fat and just live. I'm going to travel. the You know how folks talk today. When I retire, I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to do things I've always wanted to do. And God is saying, what about me? What about my plan for your life? It might not be my will for you to travel around the world to, to you know, to, to rent you a tour bus and just drive until you can't drive anymore. What about my plan for your life? That's my time that you're on. You see that? And so this was the sin of this man. For many years, I have these things stored up. And so look at what the Lord's response was. Verse 21. So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. See, and is not rich. Now, what does that mean? You have to take that's count. That's compound. So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. What is he saying? God don't have a problem with you laying up treasure. But if you're not rich towards him, then you're in trouble. God doesn't have a problem with you having things. But when those things become your God, that's where the problem is. When you're telling God what you're going to do with those things and he's not included some kind of way, that's, that, that's where the problem is. See, and so he says, and is not rich towards God. What does that mean? Not consulting God at all. I, I, God, I don't care what your plan is. This is my plan. I've worked all these years. I deserve to be happy. That's why, you know, many people today, they, they think when they're young, they, they you know, and, and you can you can read that in the book of Ecclesiastes about vanity and how it is when, when you turn 18 and you start working or 16 or whatever and you start working, you can't wait to retire. And then when you get to the age of retirement, you, you want to work again. God knows that. And so where's the fulfillment at? We think I'm going to work for 30, 40 years un until I can get my little Social Security check and get my retirement from from this or that. And I'm going to be set. And the only problem is you're sitting at home bored and not, now you're looking through the paper trying to figure out somebody that's going to hire you at that age. Vanity. God knows it. And, and so you think you're fulfilled when I retire. I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to do it. No, you're not going to do anything. You're going to get to that point and then you're going to realize it was all for nothing. In other words, your life is not fulfilled if you're not rich towards God. If you're not doing what God called you to do, you're just living an empty life. You see that? Well, let's, you may say, well, where is that in the Bible? Let's go look at that. The 12th chapter real quick. And this is where we're in. The 12th chapter of the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. Now, of course, you know, if you know anything about the book of Ecclesiastes, you know that, of course, Solomon wrote it and he was talking about vanities, the different vanities of the world and how men we work and we and we do all of these things. And then it's, you know, we only live for a short time, but it's like, what does it all even matter? From from the time of birth until the time of death, what 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 are you doing that really matters? You know, there's this old saying, only what you do for Christ will last. You see, and so what are you doing that really matters? How are you changing lives for the kingdom? You, you, you know, you can take uh, some of these entertainers that are that are singing out in the world. They may have the, the, the best voice in the world and they may open up uh, to a packed house full of, 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 of people that are, are clapping for them and they may entertain those people and, and really, really just pour their heart out to the people and, and entertain them. But you know, when it's all said and done, those people are going to go home. Those lights are going to be cut out. Yeah, they, they may have paid 30 or $40 to entertain you, you know, for you to entertain them, but then what does it matter? You may have someone that put out a C that put out a CD, you know, and you think about how, how it goes, even in, 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 the, in the industry, in the music industry and things like that. You have people, they put out a CD and they may say, this is the best CD of the year. People may listen to it for a year, 
But then two years later, you better be coming out with something else. You see the vanity there? Nobody just make one CD and say, this is going to bless y'all for the rest of your life. No, we want to hear something new. You better come out with some new material for us to buy. You see, this whole world is built around vanity. You know, uh, you can buy a computer today. Next week is obsolete. The program that they put out for it next week don't work with what you got. You buy something with Windows 7, they'll come out with Windows 8. 20 years from now, they have Windows 100. Everybody see that? I can remember in the 80s, we really thought we were something. We had a car with an 8-track. You couldn't tell us anything. Oh, we were bumping. <laughs> then they came out with cassettes. All right, we done upgraded. We bought the little adapter, the 8-track adapter with the cassette. You can put the cassette in it. Now we somebody. We just put a towel over it so people don't know it's an adapter. But... And then they came out with CDs. Well, wait a minute, what is this? Every time I upgrade, save up my little money to buy something, y'all done moved on to something else. And that's the way the world is. You know, this Solomon, he, he, the Bible says he's the wisest man for a reason. You see? So let's read that. Verse 13 of the chapter 12 of the book of Ecclesiastes. These are the last two verses. And this is what, this is the whole thing that God wanted us to see here. Verse 13. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the what? Whole duty of man. Everybody see that? Now, other than that, you just living a wasted life. Your whole purpose in this whole entire life is to fear God and keep his commandments. That's what you were put here to do. Not to see how pretty you can be. Not to compete with people walking on stage. Your whole job is to fear God and keep his commandments. Verse 14, why? For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In other words, everything that we've done, when we stand before him on that day, he's going to let us know what our motives were. Well, Lord, I was singing for you. No, you weren't. Not all that hooping. I don't need a remix. Everybody see that? Uh, the, the hearts of man is going to be standing, is going to be before them. Everything that we did, whether it's preaching, it, it, even if we did it for him, he's going to show us what our motives are, you see, and whether they're pure. And so let's line up. Let's line up with God's will in this kingdom. That's how we function in the kingdom of righteousness is by obeying what he tells us to do. That, that's how we function. We, we give our time to him and, and we don't walk in pride and say what we're going to do and, and, and things like that. We have to be submitted to him completely if, uh, if we're going to do anything for the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> All right. We'll go ahead now and open it up for comments. If anybody have a comment, we'll. All right, if you're on the phone and you have a comment or anything, you can press one and we'll take your we'll take your comment. Anyone here locally have a comment? All right, if not, we'll just say we, we thank God for you all that have joined us, and we pray that uh, something was said that uh, blessed you, and we pray that uh, also that these things will be taken to heart and that we will uh, continue to line up with God's word. Amen. Let us go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that we've had to come before you and sit in your presence and hear what you have to speak to us. And God, we pray that as we leave this place, that we will not leave your presence, Lord, that we will take what we've heard and not allow the enemy to come in and steal it, Lord, or to, for, it to, for it not to bear fruit. But help us, Lord, to bring forth fruit with the word that we've heard, Lord. We always ask that you will continue to prepare our hearts to receive what you have to say.
Lord, and when the time comes, we ask that your sweet Holy Spirit will remind us of the things that we've heard on tonight. Lord, help us to be more watchful with the things that we say and how we use our time. And, uh, and help us always, Lord, to recognize you, Lord, that you're the one. That every second that we live is, is a second that you've blessed us with. And help us, Lord, to use our time more wisely. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.